la, the Lax Friedrich scheme, and we also already de, uh, obtained our amplification factor for this before when we were discussing von Neumann analysis, and it was cosine squared phi plus sigma squared sine squared phi. Well, I'm already put in the modulus here. And our phase is the arctan of sigma tan phi. And so we get a dissipation error. which is equal to the modulus of G, the same thing that we wrote above, and the dispersion error, is equal to the numerical one divided by phi, uh, sigma phi, so arc tan of sigma tan phi divided by sigma phi. And again, we have a plot of these errors with respect to the phase angle for different values of sigma, which we can look at to see how this scheme behaves. And I've got these. Here's the Lax Friedrichs. This is the diffusion error. You see for the diffusion error that the um, amplitudes are strongly damped for small values of sigma here, down here, but not so much for larger sigmas. We use 0.8, which was going to be up around here. So you see here why we saw very small diffusion with this scheme. And um, we see that there is no diffusion error, um, no diffusion error for phi equal to pi, right here, right? Now recall that phi equal to pi was related to this wavelength of 2, we just did the we just derived this in the previous slide, this uh, relates to the wavelength of 2 delta x. So basically any errors that occur at a wavelength of 2 delta x are not going to be damped by the solution. Which 2 delta x, so two, two, 2 mesh points, okay, which has to do with this even odd decoupling that I was explaining before. So any errors with that wavelength um, will not be damped. So in order to avoid these oscillations we need um, actually for the in order to avoid these types of oscillations we would need the behavior of the scheme to have a, a, a a damping here which is less than 1 for phi equal to pi. Okay, um, That is our diffusion error. Dispersion error looks like this. And you can see that the dispersion error is always greater than 1. Okay, Which means that we always have a leading phase error. Now let's look at Lax Wendroff. For that one, we had also obtained already our amplification factor, and we can write the modulus, and it is 1 minus 4 sigma squared, 1 minus sigma squared sine. This is our dissipation error. Phase error is again 
easily obtained with the art can of the imaginary and real parts of G. And let's see, I've got 10 minus 1 of sigma sine phi. And yes, here is the um, square that leads to this fourth power here. 2 sigma squared sine squared of phi half. This divided by sigma phi. So again, I have a plot of that. And you can see from the plot of the diffusion error for the lax wendrock scheme that we could again estimate quantitatively our, um, our amplitude. And you see that there's quite of this flat region here, a lot of a flat region, okay, where it, the um, diffusion error is clo closer to 1. So this is kind of our accuracy region here. where the diffusion error is about 1, so the amplitudes are not really damped very much. And what happens generally, well, we can see from this picture that this, is, this, this area is much larger than in the upwind scheme. We have this, this flat part, close to 1, and we could calculate for, we could calculate, again, from looking at the plot, um, for our previous tests and for example our test let's look immediately at our test number three which had phi equals to pi divided by 6.25 and uh, which is 28 degrees and we'd have to blow up this plot around 30 here or use a little program to calculate that a little nice calculator to obtain those results, but it gives you a diffusion error for sigma equals to 0.8 gives diffusion error of more or less about 0 0.9985. So after 80 time steps, you get a reduction of um, amplitude of point uh, 89. And if you went and looked at our plot, the plot that I showed you for the calculation, you could see that it's, you know, this is what, 10%, so 10% reduction. If you recall the lax wendroff for test number three, it had a little bit of a diffusion in the um, high frequency wave example, it's about 10%. This is consistent with what we observed already. And what about dispersion errors? Here they are. These are dispersion errors. The first order upwind, we had these different schemes. First order upwind we saw that the diffusion error decreases away from 1. In this case, it's a little bit confusing, but when we say the error decreases away from 1, actually an error, this is a measure of error which is exact when it's equal to 1. When it's equal to 1, there is no diffusion, there's no change in the amplitude. So as the value of this epsilon d goes away from 1 decreasing, we are going to see more and more damping, right? So. Um, don't be confused by that terminology. The value of epsilon d decreases means that we have actually more error, right? Because there's more damping. Decreases away from 1, the value 1, which is, means perfect, no damping. And this happened very quickly with increasing frequency. indicating that for uh, higher frequencies, the damping is uh, very large, and we saw, of course, that this um, meant that these schemes were completely unusable when we had the 
the, the for example, we saw this wave packet that have that had four periods, and we saw how it got damped uh, catastrophically um, in our in our demo that we showed in class, right? So really, this makes it very difficult to use these these skins for any transport problems. Then we saw the plot of epsilon phi, and we saw that epsilon phi was less than one, or that means a lagging error because remember. Epsilon phi is the numerical velocity divided by the exact convection velocity. So if this is less than one, it means that the numerical convection velocity is smaller, slower. The, the solution moves slower in the numerical scheme. We saw that this happened for current numbers of uh, larger than 0.5, and it was greater than one or a leading error in the sense that the numerical now um, velocity is faster for values of sigma less than 0.5. And it was equal to 1 for sigma equal to uh, 0.5. Now, the uh, lax friedrichs <coughs> scheme which is also first order. We saw that a diffusion error showed strong damping for smaller sigma. Smaller current number and no damping for the case phi equals to pi, which is related to the um, wavelength equals to 2 delta x, which we interpreted as meaning that small errors that have a frequency of twice the mesh size are not going to be damped at all. So any errors that appear in the solution of twice the mesh size, you know, will just accumulate during the simulation, which was related to this odd even decoupling, this kind of staircase solution that we were seeing every, um, every other point, having kind of like a, uh, a jagged result, okay? And it's related to the fact that there's no damping at this frequency. And we saw uh, also in our plot for the phase error that this was always greater, greater than one, in other words, a leading error. Then, for our lax wendroff we um, observed that the diffusion error exhibits a large region where um, we could say that the solution is accurate, loosely speaking, an accurate region where this epsilon d is about 1, this flat region, and this is typical of higher order schemes. And for the phase error, we saw that it was mostly smaller than one, indicating a lagging solution. And then for the leapfrog, we didn't, we didn't finish that. Well, that's where we uh, came to the end of last lecture. We didn't show those, so we'll finish that today by looking at leapfrog. <laughs> this one was pending last class, and we'll look at it right now. Okay. So for the leapfrog scheme, um, so note for the leapfrog for, for the leapfrog scheme, you, we have the results in our uh, previous lectures of the amplification factor, and um, recall that for this scheme, the modulus of the amplification factor is equal to one. 
indicating that it has no diffusion error. For this reason, um, the leapfrog scheme is particularly useful in um, calculations that go on for a long t time. If you have to calculate for a very long time, and this will not kill your solution because of the fact that there's no diffusion error. So, long-term long -term simulations are particular applications for um, the leapfrog. One example of this is um, some weather forecast codes use this. For example, some weather forecast codes, when you want to do a prediction um, for a longer term, say three to four days, and you have to make many, many time steps to get to those two or three or four days, um, you want to avoid diffusion error. So <coughs> this is, uh, this is a, a, a scheme that is useful for that. It can have other problems in terms of stability in the case of nonlinear problem, uh, nonlinear uh, uh, equations, PDEs, but uh, there's some trickery that can be applied there to stabilize it, and that's the way it's used in weather forecasting. And so it does have some applications. You were asking Basan last time, you know, what is it good for? And here you have your answer. It's got some weird behavior, but some good qualities. And so in the end, you see every scheme has its pluses and its disadvantages, and this becomes an art of which scheme to choose for a particular problem. And sometimes there'll be a little bit of trial and error, but over time you gain some sort of feeling for what each scheme is good for. And understanding your problem, you might feel you know, that one is going to be more appropriate than other. So the dispersion error in this case Skipping some of the calculations. Remember that was the um, we used the um, imaginary part of the amplification factor divided by the real part of the amplification factor. Take the uh, inverse tangent and so on. So we, we know how to calculate this, and we already had our amplification <coughs> factor. You can check it if you feel like it. But this is our our result. I'll just skip some of the derivations and spare you that, and we'll just write hoping I didn't make any mistakes. But I do have my plot that I took from some source, and so therefore the plot at least is correct. And I have sigma squared sine squared phi, 1 minus that, and all under the square root. And that's our argument of the inverse tangent, and all of this is divided by phi multiplied by the current number. Gives you plus or minus, and then you apply um, some algebra here and trigonometric identities to get sine, the inverse sine of sigma sine phi divided by sigma phi. And in the plot, this one looks like this. I'm going to have to give you a moment to write that down and erase it from my slide so I can show you the plot because I didn't leave enough space and show you what that looks like and you see that it is mostly um, less than one indicating a lagging error for the leapfrog a lagging solution the leapfrog scheme also is good it gives more accurate results For smooth solutions, our solution, because we see that 
well, we know that the diffusion error is equal to 1, so that means that amplitudes are correct, correctly modeled. And we see that for low frequencies, and smooth and slowly varying, I suppose, now the phase error is close to 1. So for a kind of, you know, smooth solution that doesn't have much frequency content in it, um, then we'll see that this <coughs> behaves well. In the case of the demo that we showed last class, there were oscillations, but again, those oscillations appear where the um, slope of the solution had, a, had a, a jump. One possible problem is that because of the neutral stability, or so the fact that our amplification factor is equal to 1 for all values of sigma less than 1, where the um, current number is less than 1, then we could have some problems because basically if there are any high frequency errors, these are not going to be damped. There are always errors in our solution. And in this case, there's no damping. And uh, all of this analysis that we have um, done so far is for linear problems, and it happens, in fact, that the leapfrog method can become uh, unstable, for example, for uh, the Burgers equation, so for the nonlinear, case, and so in general it is not recommended, so you see there's the problems with uh, any non-smooth solution, uh, we want uh, things to have, you know, change very slowly for the leapfrog to be a good uh, scheme, so this is, it means that it's not good for any high speed flows especially if shocks can occur. One note about the oscillations. We haven't explained at all so far why these oscillations appear. So we don't we, we we don't know the origin. In fact, we would require some more analysis for that um, than the one we've done so far, so we'll delay that to another time. So we've seen those with the um, higher order schemes. We know that we can expect them with higher order schemes, the, the lax wendroff we saw them on the lax wendroff and the leapfrog. We don't know why they come here, but we can explain why they occur behind our traveling wave. Of course, you will easily agree that the oscillations have high frequency, just from looking at our demos. Okay, so we agree with that. Now, we have looked at the value of the dispersion error for the lax Wendroff and also our leapfrog methods, and so that in both cases it was predominantly 
less than 1, which indicates, especially at higher frequencies, And this indicates that the errors, any errors, these errors of oscillations, uh, they will have a convection velocity which is um, uh, slower. We have a dispersion error less than one, and therefore the convection velocity of the errors is slower than the physical one. You agree? And that explains why they lag behind. The errors themselves lag behind. So, in the case of leapfrog, in fact, you saw that also the dispersion error tends to zero for phi tending to pi, the rightmost side of our plot, and so the oscillations are stronger. than in the case of the lax wendroff And so, to see this more graphically, we're going to consider an alternative scheme, a new one that we haven't uh, discussed yet. So consider an alternative which is due to Mr. Beam and warming. The beam and warming scheme. So recall the derivation of the lax wendroff For the lax wendroff we derived this based on the Taylor expansions, and it leads to an equation which was u n plus 1 i equals u n i minus c delta t and we had the first derivative x at i and we had an additional term here we included our second order derivative with a term that had c squared delta t squared over 2 and u x x the second derivative plus and a term of order delta t cubed. So we then discretize all the special derivatives of this using a backward difference. Or upwind scheme. And I didn't leave much space for that, so well, I'll just write it in the next slide. Everybody got that so far? Yes? Good. So we're on the beam warming, and um, so, sorry, um, I said that wrong in the previous case. Um, in the lax wendroff we use central difference. If instead we use backward difference, we get the beam on warming. Okay? Sorry, I got that. Let me let me use backward difference instead of the central difference of lax wendroff. Alphabet soup in that sentence there. But I hope you understand it. So is the, we're going to use one of these, um, and I'm going to actually in a, in a little while show you how these are derived. We have already introduced a backward difference previously. We just briefly mentioned, as an example, um, the final difference scheme, a second order upwind. You might recall we did it a few classes ago. So we're going to do that. The second order upwind for the first derivative. And so we're going to write, we had un plus 1 
i equal u n i. And here we had minus c t times u x, the first derivative, the u dx. And so instead of writing a central difference, we use an upward, <coughs> upwind here. So it was minus um, c delta t, and we're going to divide by delta x, which gives us our sigma, because we're going to use a, a central difference. Uh, the central difference has 3u n i minus 4u n at i minus 1, and plus u n at i minus 2. And this is divided by 2x, so the 2 remains and the x has been absorbed into the current number there, okay? Now, that's the first derivative with respect to x, and our second derivative, you use our usual, um, um, well, backward difference, so it's not a central difference, we use the backward difference, and it's going to be u and i minus 2 u i minus 1 n, and plus u i minus 2. So you see we're taking the point i and two points behind it. Okay, this is our backward difference. Second order, so we need three points. Um, we mentioned this one before. I'll just show you in a moment how these are obtained, how uh, of one way that one can obtain these. So now the stability analysis. So stability, and I'm going to skip some steps and just give you the result for our amplification factor, we get g is equal to 1 minus imaginary number sigma and 1 plus 2, 1 minus sigma sine squared of phi half, and this is multiplied by sine phi minus 2 sigma 1 minus 1 minus sigma cosine phi it's a little messy sine squared of phi half sorry? yes, in the first sine squared sine phi squared phi half phi. yes, phi half in, is the, phi half is the argument of the sine and here again phi half is the argument of the sine so we apply these half-angle formulas, trigonometric formulas. And uh, we get that the scheme is conditionally stable for a value between 0 and 2. The diffusion error, then, is epsilon d equal to the modulus of g, and that gives you square root of 1 minus sigma times 1 minus sigma squared, 2 minus sigma. As always, we have sigma as a parameter, and it depends on the phase angle. So the best way is to stick this into maple or Matla or mat Mathematica or whatever, and get some parametric plots of it. You can probably use Grapher, which is free and included in your Mac OS X, for those of you that have Mac. And, um, in fact, the formula for E5 is a little bit more messy, and I didn't want to write it down. I'm just going to show the plots because it's the best way to visualize what's happening for this particular case. And so, before I clear the slide, I'll let you finish. For those of you taking notes. Okay, so here's the picture of the diffusion error. So again, you see, now this is a, um, a second order. We've used second order differences, second order um, and so again, you see this behavior where you have this flat region indicating um, that um, 
the uh, it's more accurate, right? This is the accurate region, if you will. Then, um, what else? I guess the more interesting part is the dispersion error. It's right here. The dispersion error is predominantly above one. You see here, it's greater than one. So E phi is predominantly greater than one, which means in this case, this is uh, for sigma less than one. So these values are. 0.75, uh, well, it's hard to read, but this is, even though this one is 0.25, it's generally greater than 1, and then it crosses over only for the highest frequencies, but generally greater than 1. And so that means that, um, in general, the numerical solution will move faster This one, this one, I think it's a mistake in um, because there's no other choice than this one being the actual cross. So this one is for this one here is for sigma greater than one. There's a possibility for this one to be stable between one and two. Remember, so this one you can have sigma greater than one. In those cases, you you will see um, that behavior, sigma for sigma greater than one. So this is this one. It's just a mistake in the plot. Instead of the diamonds, it should be little crosses. So the numerical solution in general for all the other values of sigma smaller than 1, we will have the numerical solution moving faster. And so this means that errors that have high frequency, these oscillations, should move ahead of the solution in this case. ahead of the traveling wave. So let me show you a demo. I've got a little program here. So let's run this one. This is the same demo that we called test number three that we did in the previous classes. So we have the four periods within a distance uh, of one. And again, in the, the, uh, the, you will recall that for the lax wendroff and the leapfrog, we had these oscillations on the back. And now in this case, you have them in the front. The high frequency numerical errors lead the solution. So this is what we have here for this same test problem number three of um, previous lectures, we will have in this case the oscillations leading. This was our test number three. And these are the parameters that I used for this demo, and you see the oscillations lead in this case. Okay, so some final notes just to close this chapter on the spectral analysis of the numerical methods. First order schemes, again, we've said this many times, they generate large errors. In general, not recommended. Good for the purposes of doing some demos and getting some experience. Uh, with numerical calculations, but generally not recommended for real applications. Second order schemes often um, offer acceptable errors, but we should be careful with these oscillations, especially at higher frequencies.
And so um, this can lead to a very important kind of criterion for choosing your mesh size. So looking at the plot for diffusion error for <coughs> the lax wendroff scheme. And we see that this can, for example, help us um, establish a phase angle limit This is quite important, phase angle limit, phi li uh, limit. Basically, we want the diffusion error to be close to 1. Let's just write it as, so we want the diffusion error close to 1. So for the diffusion error, this is, this is what we want to see. And we want it close to 1. So you can see from this plot, this is for the lax wendroff scheme. That, you know, if we look at this plot more or less, maybe we want to go around here. And we want perhaps phi around 10. I mean, this is just, 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 um, a criterion that we could apply and this is a decision. So if we go to phi around 10, we see that our diffusion error is going to be very small. Remember that once you start applying this over and over many, many time steps, even a 1% error can cause a very large difference in diffusion. So we want this to be very small. Okay. So suppose we choose um, this limit, phi equals 10. So looking at the plot, we said, okay, we're going to choose for the lax wendroff a limit in phi of about 10. And we saw that in that case, which is more or less equal to pi over 18, 10 degrees, so changing into radians, and this is for a diffusion error pretty close to 1. We established that. So the key quantity defining the accuracy of um, the time-dependent simulation is going to be the number of mesh points per wavelength. So let's call that n number of mesh points per wavelength. And so that's going to be, of course, the wavelength divided by delta x. That's going to give us the number of mesh points per wavelength. And we require that phi which is equal to k delta x, which we can also write <coughs> 2 pi over lambda times delta x, right, the relationship between the wave number and wavelength, and we require this to be smaller than this limit, the phase, the, the, the phase angle limit. And when we do that, we see, well, we can write this n lambda equal to lambda over delta x. And we want, um, so from here, you can see you can arrange it so that you have lambda delta x, and you get that is going to be greater or equal than 2 pi over the phase angle limit.
So this is basically a um, requirement on your mesh size. The required mesh size to be mesh size to be able to resolve a certain wavelength. And so you can see um, if we wanted, like we're look, like we uh, suggest here for the lax Wendroff, right? That we want if we required the phase angle limit to angle limit to be pi over 18, then you put that here in this equation, and it gives you the we need at least 36 points per wavelength. Just putting it in that equation. And so depending on your solution, you can find a um, required delta x for that. Uh, if you put, for example, um, instead, if you put phi lim equals pi over 12, it gives you 24 points per wavelength. Perhaps it would be safer to do this. And if you recall our previous test number three, for the test number three we had four waves, remember? And um, we calculated this with a delta x equal to 0. I think 0. 0.05 or whatever it was. According to my notes here, this test three was done with only... 12 points per wavelength in my demo that I showed in class, which is inadequate. So that shows why test number three failed. For the lax wendroff you already saw about 10% of amplitude decrease, if you recall, for test number three. So it's because of this. So this means that if you know something about your solution, there's a way to determine a safe choice for the refinement required to resolve that without many errors. Um, it turns out that this is quite a severe requirement, okay? This, this, is, this is quite a severe requirement. And um, for, this is for unsteady problems, of course. Now, if you have steady problems, then even in the steady problems, you have a transient phase in your calculation where you use an iterative method to tend this artificial time variable that we talked about. So even if it's a steady solution, within that transient period, the same applies as we've discussed here. You still have to um, respect these, these considerations to be able to get an accurate solution for that transient. Otherwise, you will have a solution which is excessively damped within your iterations, and that, that'll really destroy your calculation. So this is an important consideration. This is a very important, the number of mesh points per wavelength is a very important criterion, and we see that we can get that from our analysis that we've done so far for each of the numerical schemes that you choose to use.